Amen. Good to see you guys today. How are we doing, V-Town? Good? Nice. Well, it's amazing for me, as much as these guys joke about me being an old man, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, and I'm really at that, that age uh, where you start thinking back to your childhood, and you're looking at what's happening now, and I'm like, man, I really truly did come from a simpler time. Okay, born in 1970, so those of you who are near my age, I'm 52, kind of reflect back, right, 70s, and kind of grew up into 80s, and man, it was just different. It was just so different, and we had it and how these kids have it nowadays. Um, anybody remember Saturday morning cartoons? You had to wait till Saturday morning? We didn't have cable like these heathens, you know, down the street. We had ABC, NBC, CBS. You waited till Saturday morning, and you just hoped beyond hope those two times a year when the new stuff came out. And they were like innocent cartoons. There's some crazy stuff nowadays. Our cartoons were so innocent, they, they taught you things. Anybody remember this? You just see the picture, and if you know, you know, right? Anybody remember what this was called? Schoolhouse Rock. Yep, there we go. I'm just a bill, I'm only a bill, and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. <laughs> Poor little Bill was waiting to become a law, and you were like, come on, dude, make it. We learn stuff, man, like through cartoons. Conjunction, junction? Yeah. Oh, thank God for first service. I'm like, if nobody knows this, I'm just walking off the stage. I'm done. No hope for you people. Guys, it was so, this is the one that really gets me though. So I had a job when I was a kid. I was 11 years old when I got my first job. So this wasn't like um, I was at a candy store or cleaning up in a church or something. Let, let's just think about today. Let's think about little Johnny J, 11 years old. You know what my job was? To go out into the dark, into neighborhoods amongst the houses, and deliver newspapers. 11 years old. Let's just like work this out with your parents going, get up. Get out there in the dark, son. Go make your money. We had to have these papers delivered before 6.30 a.m. I, I delivered the, the Des Moines Register, and that's what you did. And if that's not crazy enough, after we survived the gauntlet of abduction in the morning, after dinner at night, our parents would send us back out with a little envelope of money and a little book to go collect the money from people. You're knocking on strangers' doors asking for money, and they're like, come on in, little boy. Come on into my house. You want some cocoa? We're like, yeah! And it was, because we didn't have these shenanigans like we have now. Guys, that's, that's how I was born and raised, you know? It was just different, man. It was simple. We're not sending kids out nowadays, are we? Out into the neighborhoods, out into the... We, wouldn't, we don't even let them, want them go over to their friend's house anymore, guys. It's a completely different time. And I, I saw this picture. This was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph from 2021, Minneapolis. You can imagine what's going on. And isn't it amazing they say, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And can't you just feel it? And you're not even like, it's not even uncommon anymore, guys. It's the chaos, the, the insanity, the destruction. I saw the flag upside down, thought, man, isn't that how it feels? Just like everything is upside down. And who's not thinking on some level, like, how many times you hear people like, I'm not bringing kids into this crazy world, forget that. We're hearing this more and more. People choosing, like, I'm not doing it. I hear a lot of believers like, man, I hope, I hope he comes back today. I just, I can't take it. It's hard. Who knows what's next? I just want to go home to heaven. Anybody feel like that at times? I do. There's days like, man, God, it'd be so good if today's the day. Bop, 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 bop. But I want us to think about this, and I don't think we do this enough, so we want to go to heaven, right? Can you imagine being there and what it's going to be like? But let's think about the audacity that we're sitting here as followers of Jesus, and at some point up there, the high king of heaven 
in perfection, in who knows what heaven's like, decides to leave that and to come back down here and deal with hell on earth. So we're talking about, guys, and we're talking about Jesus, the Father loving you, loving me, loving this world so much to leave perfection and to come down into the human condition. So we've been in this series called Prep Time. It's been the whole thing, all of history has been God getting ready for this time, for this moment, for this chosen one, this Messiah, to come down on here and fulfill a whole new thing here on earth. And we are looking today at literally a pivotal moment in human history. And there's so much in these little verses. And I hope that you guys have, have already fallen in love with Jesus. But if you haven't, to think about that concept, this, this perfection coming down here, and the whole thing's just about to start. So I want to invite you to stand. We're in Luke chapter 3. So much going on here. I want you to ask yourself some questions here. I want you to take this all in, but, but we can't deal with that all today. We're just going in one place. But let's just read this together. All four Gospels, by the way, include this scene. It's like a whole spotlight just shines on this moment. And remember... It's the wilderness. John the Baptist has been dunking people in water for the forgiveness of their sins. This is a whole new wackadoodle idea, by the way, guys. Not the temple, not animals being slaughtered. He's just saying, hey, you can come get some. All you sinners can come get in the water. And all of a sudden we read this. When all those people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. That should be our first question. Who's getting baptized? Sinners. Why are they getting baptized? For repentance. What is Jesus doing in this line? Hmm. And as he was praying, Jesus is praying. Jesus needs to access the Father somehow here on earth. That's interesting. Heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. Sometimes we got to stop and pause. Anyone like, I just thought it was a little dove coming down. There's your caca again, Terry. That's right. It's a dove. That's the bird. He came in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. An audible voice. God is speaking. Just take these words in. You are my son, whom I love, with you. My heart, oh, I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. So you guys can go ahead and have a seat. I know it lists more verses on your outline there. It gets into whole genealogy then. So a lot of times what we're doing, we take these, you know, we're sitting down like, okay, there's so much here. And again, guys, there's so many questions. And they're all valid. They're all good. So we'll sit down with these passages. And, and man, what I love about God's word, it is, it's so alive and active. But you're like, God, what do you have for me? What are you saying about yourself? What are you saying about Jesus? What are you saying about me? And what do you have for our people? Like, what do you want us to tell, tell us today? And for me, this is a passage I go back to all the time. And every time I do, I go back to this one area. And God just wants us to sit here with this today. This is so important. The conversation that the father is having with the son at the beginning of his ministry. Before it all starts. So I want to highlight just this section right here. Okay. That Jesus gets into the water with sinners. He's not a sinner. We know that. He's perfect. Then an audible voice. We know this. This is very rare that God will speak for someone to hear out loud. An audible voice says some fascinating things. Let's just take these real quick. You're my son. You're my boy. I hope that in your life, that you've had a man, that you've had a woman, that you've had somebody important, that on some level, 
for no reason has just come up. Maybe they've put your arm, their arm around you, sat down on the couch and got real close. And they're just, there's something in their eyes, they're beaming. And they're like, oh, I just want you to know, man, you're my girl. Not in a possessive way. You know when you feel it like, oh, you are my girl. You're my boy. Just to feel those words. The father is taking a moment to let Jesus just know, I want to remind you, you're my son. Guys, this passage so often, for, for a good reason, is used by people to, to slam dunk that Jesus was God. You know, this is where we can see the Father, we can see the Son, we can see the Spirit. We talk about the Trinity. And again, that's great and real. But for me, this passage, don't miss this today, is so much about the humanity of Jesus. We miss this all the time. Why does God need to remind God that he's his son? Like, you know, Jesus is just like C-3PO and just kind of going around through the motions. He's a human. He's in this strange place, and it's about to start. And the Father wants this human man to know, you're my boy, and I love you. Does God need to be reminded that he's loved? No. God is all-powerful, he's omniscient, he knows everything, but there's this man standing in this mucky river at 30 years old before it all begins that needs an audible reminder, I love you. Did you have someone in your life? Did your parents, I like to say, did they abuse I love yous? And we should as parents, by the way. Did you have a friend, a relative, someone that just when they saw, I just want you to know, man, I love you. I love you so much. I hope that you are those people doing that for people in your life, taking time. If it's important for the father of Jesus, the heavenly father, to audibly tell him, I love you. If he needed reminding, don't we need reminding at times? We need that, guys. So we understand this, right? This is what dads do. This is what moms do. This is what good parents do, right? Uh, again, you guys know I've become a grandparent now, little Nico. Little Nico had to do nothing for me. Be like, you're my boy. I love you, homie. Let's go. He's been with us this weekend, and he's starting to teeth. So he's been going around to stuff like this, and he'll just walk up, and he'll just start chewing like a beaver, like the end. I'm like, dude, I love it. Yes. We're taking videos. We're like, look, he's chewing the wood, man. Like posting it. And you're like, what? He's, he's mine. I love him. But there's this last part here that we have to stop. And we, again, guys, let's just always pause and be like, what's going on here? So you're my boy. I love you. With you, I'm well pleased. Did I miss something? There's, there's nothing that Jesus has really done up to this point. So again, if you know the Bible, if you know the Gospels, in fact, Luke is the only book, as you saw, where we dealt with little 12-year-old boy Jesus who basically ran away and hung out in the temple. But we know nothing except that Jesus was born and then all the Gospels start when his ministry starts. He's done nothing yet. He's a 30-year-old and he's just there. Nobody knows who he is other than John the Baptist. Did I miss the part of why God pleased with what? What's God proud of? That he's faking it in the water? Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand. What in the world is God pleased with? Let's start thinking about, in our society, a 30-year-old that looked a lot like Jesus. So, you know, we would walk around. What people are we like? Okay, you need to get your life together. 30? You haven't found anybody yet, man? You're not married? You don't even have a girlfriend? Jesus, like, come on, what, what's going on there, buddy? You might want to get a little something, put some, like, palm leaves under there. Happy Palm Sunday, by the way, people. <laughs> I forgot to do my palm joke. You know, he's got no spouse, and therefore, he's got no kids, right? What father doesn't want their kid to find a significant other and, and have kids? This is why we're proud, right? Oh, they found somebody, they're having kids. What about a job? You know, at least he's got, like, the, the, the big job. We don't know of any job that Jesus has. Say he's a carpenter, but there's nothing that he has some successful shop anywhere. 
No friends that we can see of. I'm not saying he didn't have friends, but it's not like, oh, do you remember Sammy from back in town? We've been kicking it for years. There's just, there's nothing that we know of about this guy to this point. He's done nothing. Jesus is a relative 30-year-old nobody in the water with all these other sinners. And God's sitting here saying, man, I am proud of you. So let's stop again and think, though, as we look through this passage, that is what he was doing. Jesus walks up. These people are all coming to the Father, dunking themselves in this dirty river. And Jesus, who doesn't need to, he doesn't have to, but he's been led there. And if you've been there, I'm not joking, the the Jordan River, you know, mystify it in your mind, where we were at at least, was filthy. It was pretty, pretty gross. And a perfect, sinless Savior gets in the muck, gets in the mud, and God says, I'm proud of you. And there's so much for us to learn there, guys. As Jesus starts his ministry, it starts with a tremendous act of compassion. This is what we're going to see from this man over and over again and over, things he doesn't have to do, seemingly things that he shouldn't have to, you know, be part of in places where a lot of us wouldn't want to be. Jesus keeps showing up. And it's important that we understand what this word means. I'm not a word nerd, but this one's pretty good. It comes from a couple Latin words, um, com, patio. So the word com there means with, and patio, where we get passion, means to suffer. The word compassion, when we talk about people that have that, when we're looking at Jesus' life, literally means to suffer with, to help bear someone else's burden with the idea to relieve their pain, to relieve their suffering. To be marked by compassion is to step into situations that are going to require you not just to feel bad for people, but to literally be willing to suffer with them. And we're going to see over the next few weeks and months a man who models this to us over and over and over. Just a couple of them. Think again, if his mission was just to come and die, which we're going to be celebrating on on Good Friday this week. I hope you guys come and celebrate that with us. But think about how he lived for three years. What was he doing while he lived? All of these different scenes that the Father is leading him into. We see this compassion. This is Jesus again at the beginning of his ministry. He says he's going from town to town. And I want us to notice a couple things always. Jesus sees people. Compassion begins when you walk around and you don't just like got the blinders on. I'm just doing me right now. Everywhere Jesus goes, he sees people. He's walking in these towns. He's not just preaching. He's not just handing out pamphlets. He saw the people and he felt compassion because they were distressed, dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. I feel that. I got to do something. Matthew 14, this is fascinating. We've been talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist winds up getting killed. He gets his head cut off. This is Jesus' cousin. This was the predecessor of his ministry. They were tight. They were boys, but it went down. And in his humanity, Jesus says, I got to boogie out of town for a little bit. I got to get in a boat and I got to go. Have you ever lost somebody? No, I just need some time to me. He's so human, guys. Don't miss his humanity. I just need to get away. And the Bible tells us when he lands his boat, he saw a crowd. He tries to go on vacation tries to go on a little sabbatical, but he sees these people. They're, they got some stuff, and he feels compassion for them. I know I tried to get away, but they're here, and I got to do something, man. I'm going to heal these people. There's a woman. She's a widow, and she loses her boy, and she's weeping. Guys, this is bigger. When you've, if you've lost anybody in your life, that's, that's tragic enough. In, in ancient Middle Eastern times, to lose a son and you're a widow, you've just lost your livelihood, man. You really have no way. You're banking on that boy to help bring money in. You're not going to go get like a job at Heinen's or something. Like that's kind of it. And Jesus, instead of just walking by or him, instead of him walking up and saying like, hey, listen, oh, sorry for your loss, but hey, he's in a better place when we all get to heaven. 
He saw her and he felt compassion for her. A man that says, this, this is more, I feel this. Don't we? I'm bringing him back. Guys, I want us to understand, please don't miss this man in this scene. Please don't miss that he was dealing with all the emotions that we would deal with, all the confusion. Is this, I'm 30, this thing hasn't even started. I'm 30, is this really, is this really the plan, God? He's absolutely human. The Bible makes this clear. Hebrews is a master class in Jesus Divinity, but also his humanity. And I, I love this part when God is saying he had to be made like his brethren in all things. Why did he have to become human? So he could feel. So he could know. It's going to affect his mercy in everything that he was going to do all the way leading that up to that cross. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful, ultimate, end-all, be-all high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Guys, we, we live in a day and age where, where people, again, the, the more you have, the more you can do. It's like people are walking around with this, this on them, right? Just how am I better than everybody else or how can I get better than everybody else, Right? On Facebook, Instagram, and in conversations, our new house, our new car, our new promotion, our new grandkid, our new HOA thing, whatever it is, like how can I, and if we don't have it, we're thinking about how I can get better because I certainly don't want to be down here with these people. I'm sick of living in this kind of neighborhood with that kind of people and these relatives and that coworker. I just better, 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 better. And on some levels, I get it. Nobody wants to get stuck in that. But haven't we all had those people in our life when every time we're with them, they're not always talking about how they're one up on you. It's like they're going around and their name tag just says this, man. Hey, how are you doing? And if anybody could have been wearing that, it would be Jesus standing in that water. By the way, guys, I just want to tell you a little something real quick. Don't need to be here. <laughs> but uh, saw some of you pathetic fools started to come down and check it out. I don't know if you heard this. My dad's God. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And about to do some amazing things. He's just standing there. A little fish around him. River algae. Saying nothing. Nobody nothing knows him. I'm just with you. I'm here in line with you. There's this lie that's in the world right now. And you guys know it, and I know it, and it's especially prevalent in America, and it's this. Life is, there's always something out there, right? Life is, again, when I get that thing, when I finally, I have this spouse, but if my spouse could just be like this, I could dump this one and get that. Man, I have some kids, but if my kids could just understand, I'm going to get them that coach, I'm going to give them that thing, get them back to where they need to be. Uh, we have this house, but you know what? We need to rip this out and put these countertops in or go live in this neighborhood where these people can't do this. Life is this. I need to get to that happiness. I need to get to that pleasure. I live here in this crap place, Northeast Ohio. If I could just get to Florida, that's when I'd find life. I'd find happiness. If I could just get to retirement, oh, then I'll really be living. Because that's what life is, right? Our happiness, our pleasure. Guys, who started this lie? You know what life is? Life is life. Life is the life God gave you. Jesus is standing there in that moment. It's been 30 years that's led up to getting in the water with these people, and he's saying there, God, this is the life you've given me. It didn't look like much, let me tell you that. Even as we're talking about it now, this is big news, right, compared to the things we've done. A man standing in water, life is life. What life has God given you? It's funny, Jesus even said, you know, I have come that you may have life and life to the full. It's almost like he's trying to pull back this idea, like, you keep thinking it's something else. No, it's what I've given you already, and I want you to be able to find me in that, in the pain, along with the pleasure, in the suffering, along with the good times. We can learn from all of it. It's all life. It's all part of the story, and it's all amazing. And we find this peace 
when we realize the process of retraining my mind, not to keep thinking about, well, man, what would really be awesome is when these people are all going to fall on their knees and call me king. What's really going to be awesome is when I get married to another woman who's perfect. And what's really going to be awesome is when everyone starts chanting my name, Jesus, Jesus. And guys, we do the same thing in our life. There's this thing out there. Instead of like retraining my mind to say, you know what, God, this is the life you've given me. I've got these people in my life that are still alive, and I've got these people that are gone, and I miss them like crazy. I've got a kid that we've been raising that seems to be doing all right, and I've got this wackadoodle kid named Johnny J that's freaking out and dropping me nuts. Things were going great at work, but now I lost the job. Man, church was like hopping, people were on fire, and now we've been infighting. This is the life I have. This is the place on that. Jesus is at this moment standing there. It has to be confusing, right? But Father, you've led me here, and you've led me here to love these people. And I'm, I'm the son, I'm the man that's willing to stand here and just be with them in the water. This is where you want me. I'm willing to be with them in the water. And guys, as we think about leading people on the adventure of becoming like Jesus, as we think about what does it look like, and we're so quick again in his divinity to say, well, I, I can't, I can't, you know, turn loaves or fish into feeding 5,000. You know, I, I can't raise people from the dead. But you know what's amazing? We can all stand in the water with people. We can all dive into the mud and the muck and stand there and have compassion and just be willing to be with them. In fact, Jesus doesn't seem shocked about this his whole career as the Father leads him to place to place. It gets bad. It gets worse. It's constantly insane. They're trying to kill him from the outset. And he's just willing to do it because the Father has called him there. And we walk around in our lives, and even so much in the church, guys, we're constantly surprised that life is hard. We're constantly surprised that people let us down. We're constantly surprised that people burn things down and smash things, and it's chaos. And the Bible tells us, why are you surprised? <laughs> it's always been this way. And we would do well to heed these words. Why are you surprised? Why are you always looking for an exit plan? Why are you always thinking it's just my luck? I can't catch a break. Wow, look at their marriage. Look at their life. Why can't we live in that country? Why can't I be in that tax bracket? Why are you surprised at this thing that's come on you? You think it's something strange? You don't think Jesus had things that were crazy in his life? Let's read our Bibles. It tells us, man, when these things are going on, and, it, and it's not about liking the things, but I get to rejoice that things are happening, because why? If my king, if my savior, if he was willing to come down and get in that water with me, if he was willing to leave perfection and come down to this world, he was perfect, man, to come down to have B.O. and coffee breath and pimples and headaches and sexual urges, all these things, guys, totally real. Had to suffer as a human, get tired, get weak. Man, every time I'm feeling that, I don't like it, but I got to remember, I get to participate in the same exact thing as my king did. It says that, man, the things I've done, you're going to do. We think about all the miracles. We don't think about the suffering. We don't think about the late nights. We don't think about the tired legs. I get to participate in the suffering of Christ. That's when his glory gets revealed in our life. And something else happens when we embrace our life like that and realize it just is our life. The next verse says something fascinating about this. It says that when those things come and you get insulted because people are like, are you serious? You're staying with them? Are you serious after how they treated you? You're going to let this kid back in your house after what they did? You, you accepted their apology. It's been like 10 You're going back to that church after what that lady did in that room with those people. You're gonna, you're, you look like an idiot, man. I'll tell you why I do it. 
That's what my king did for me. And it doesn't feel good, and it does feel like suffering on some level. But, man, when I do that, when I step into my life and my role, God, these are the kids you've given me. These are the people you've given me. This is the community you've given me. This is what I've been born into right now on planet Earth, and you're raising me up in it. A spirit. Do you see that? The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. What does that have to do with our scene with Jesus getting in the water? What happened when he got in the water? What happened when he got in the water? What was the first time we see the spirit come down and say, ah, oh, I can rest here. You're exactly where I want you. Not on the mountaintop. You're down there in the muck. Do you know where water goes, guys? Do you know why it's so powerful? Why is the ocean so powerful? Why are rivers so powerful? They're always trying to find the lowest spot. No ocean on a mountaintop. No rivers up there. They get wild and crazy, and they all culminate down there in the lowest spot. That's why they're so strong. That's why they're so powerful. Jesus is teaching us something different over and over. Who doesn't want a great life? My hand is raised, by the way. He's just teaching us how it becomes great. Why is God proud of him? Why would God be proud of us? Over and over, he keeps defining it. Guys, don't ever say you shouldn't be great on planet Earth. We should absolutely, the church should be the greatest place ever. Followers of Jesus should be the greatest people living and breathing on this planet, but not because we're all like, yeah, let's go us. We're great. We become great by coming down. I'm going to serve. That's how you become great. Think about all our complaining. What, what would change if I knew I become great by serving my spouse? Think about, I was challenging the guys that were here Thursday night. You know, we, we all want to, so many times we'd be like, oh, things ain't going to my church, so I'm going to go to this church because I heard things are going great there. It's my job to come here and serve people. That's how my church becomes great. It's my job to serve my community. That's how my community becomes great. It's not their job to serve me. Jesus helps us see, man, you want to you wanna be first? Be a slave. You want to be great? Serve. Why? Because that's what I'm doing. You see it over and over. I didn't come to be served. Read your Bibles. Jesus never walks into town and says, where's the cake? Where's the party? Don't you guys know who I am? I have compassion for these people. I'm here to serve. And we have a man in a filthy river about to start a ministry where God wants to do something totally different. And we don't know. It just says he was praying. But, but I have to wonder again if he's like, God, I, I'm going to need the strength to do this. This story sounds insane. He's under that water. I, I don't... I don't know, man, I'm, I'm a human, I'm, I'm praying that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm, I'm going the right way. Have you ever felt that way as a person? Am I doing the right thing as a mom? Am I doing the right thing as a dad, as a man? Like, I don't know, I just feel like I'm, I'm kind of confused. He's praying, man, God, I need, I need your help. What does it look like? And we see this fascinating thing when Jesus was praying. It says that heaven was opened. Heaven was opened. In the life of Jesus, what we're going to see on earth now, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, we begin to see this thing that was separate. It starts to blur. It starts to open up. This thing called the kingdom, this thing where, where God's spirit can rule us, where we can see things totally different. Heaven opens up to this man as he's praying. And instead of him telling God what's going on, God speaks something over his life that's going to carry Jesus through his whole ministry. You're my son. Don't ever forget that. No matter what it looks like out there, no matter what they're calling you, he's demon-possessed, he's crazy, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They said all this horrible stuff about Jesus. Remember, everywhere you go, if you never hear it again, you're my boy. Do you know that, that you're his daughter today? Do you know that you're his boy? I want you to know that, he says. 
and I love you, and I'm proud of what you're doing. And you need to know that because not a lot of people are going to be proud of you out there. I need you to know that, son, and, and followers of Jesus. He needs you to know that today too, mom. He needs you to know that today, dad, man, woman, son, daughter. He needs you to know no matter what it looks like when you're following me, that's what comes down from heaven because the veil is completely gone. On that cross, a fascinating thing happened, guys. When The moment Jesus died, historical fact, by the way, it says that, that there was a big fat curtain in the temple that separated this one room called the Holy of Holies, which, which housed the presence of God. Nobody went up in that place, man. You can't get into God's presence, okay? You can't hear these things. You can't go in that room. You're too dirty. You're too nasty. We're going to send one dude in there who we've been checking out all year. He's good. He's got his shots. If we tie a rope around his leg in case he dies, we can yank out the carcass and send in, you know, the other guy. That thing got torn from the top from heaven down to earth. It tore from the top to the bottom. It was never in operation again. God's saying that thing is wide open, full access, everybody. You can talk to me at any time. When it's dark, when it's crazy, when you're unsure, I need you to talk to me, but I want you to listen. I want you to listen. It's fascinating to me. Jesus prays. It doesn't say what he says. It says what the Father said. When you pray, are you talking more than you're listening? Are you complaining more than you're hearing what God is calling? Because I find it fascinating. We see Jesus as he was praying, and a voice came from heaven. What is the voice coming over your life today? And we're, we're wrapping up here, guys. And Neil, if you want to start coming up here, getting ready. Ushers, if you want to start getting ready for communion. Because I want us to think about this, guys. Jesus in that moment, in that water, Uncertain is having communion with the Father. I need you to know what's important right now. You're my boy. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're my boy. I love you. And I'm proud of you. And I want you to start thinking about your own situation today. Everybody in this room, in some way, shape or form is in some type of water or you love someone who's in something like that and man again water's amazing but it's powerful and then i feel like it can drown you and i promise you what he wants us all to know today so beautiful the picture of jesus i'm with you in the water i'm right there and you guys can come this is, this is what's going to happen it's just us, so this is what's kind of cool. We get to get a little weird with this stuff. They're going to pass out the bread. They're going to pass out the cup. And I want you to think about what Jesus is willing to do. Thank you, Brother Terry. What he was willing to do for that curtain to be broken, for us to hear what we need to hear, to live the life that we've been born into, to live the life that we've been raised into, guys. It's time we stop complaining and thinking about, man, I wish it wasn't, I can't believe it isn't, instead of saying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus stood there and said, this is it. This is, this is the life you've given me, Father, and it turned out to be the most amazing life of all. But what about you again? Where are you at? What part of your life do you not want right now that you've very much been born into in a situation? And I want you to hold this bread in your hand. Hold this broken body, this representation of that. This is how far he went, how much he suffered to get us to be where he is so we could hear his voice, so we could do what he wants us to do right here and now to bring the kingdom, to bring heaven to all this chaos. I see that picture back from the beginning. What God wants is not for me to get up out of here. What God wants is for me to do what Jesus did and say, I'm going to bring some heaven down right now. And whatever it takes, as crazy as it sounds, if they think I'm nuts, I'm going to believe that his same spirit is in me. If they laugh, if they ridicule, these are the people you've given me, God. And just like you, I'm with them in the water. I'm with them in the water. And so as you hold these, 
I just want to read. I was reflecting last night, finishing up, and I thought, man, God, what do you want to say to me? I want to hear. I have cuckoo stuff going on, and and some of you guys do too, and I'm not sitting here saying, I want to be real careful here, that I am the voice of God, but what I love, again, when I sit down and when I'm in those places, I'm like, God, what would you want to say to some of our people? I know some of them are hurting so bad. How can they hear that voice, man? How can they know? In some of these situations where you feel so far, you feel so distant. And I just started writing. And so I just want you to know that heaven's open right now. It's wide open. And what does God think of you in your situation that you're in right now that seems so hard? And I just want to read a few words. I see you. I see you. It's 2 a.m. Third time up. You can barely move. As your little one cries, I see your hot, silent tears slide down your cheeks. Man, when will it stop? You wonder. When, when will it be my turn to rest? And you wrap your arms around their tiny body. Please, please, sleep. The weight of the world pulling you under. And I see you. Despite the pain, despite the exhaustion, whispering, shh, mommy's here. Mommy's here with lips that can barely make it over the waves. I see you. You've never been more beautiful to me. I'm with you in the water. I see you. The office is empty. That workload piled sky high. The lights are low. You missed dinner again. It's pushing 9 p.m. And you know there's another hour at least. Worst yet, the next day holds the same. And the next, and the next. But I see you. Despite the pain, despite the exhaustion, you pull another paper from the file. You clear the emails. You finish the job. I see you, son. Walking silently into your bedroom, not wanting to wake your bride. And you kiss her with lips that barely make it over the waves. And I see you. And I've never been more proud. I'm with you in the water. I see you. Scanning the web of pick lines and IVs. Monitors flash, beep randomly. You. Watching their chest rise and fall. You, sitting for hours, holding a limp hand, wiping a feverish brow. You, changing the soiled sheets. Again collapsing as you sob into the cushions of the sofa. I see you. And despite the pain, despite the exhaustion, you rise, wipe your face, force a smile, crawling into bed, curling beside their motionless body. Hey, I'm here. I'm right here, you say, with lips that can barely make it over those waves. And I see you. I have never seen you look more like my son than in that moment. I am with you in the water. I see you in that dark hallway of depression. I see you in the grip of addiction. I see you waiting for them to come home. Please come home. I see you alone on Easter. Again, I see you. Telling yourself it's okay to go, to leave, to end all this. Minutes, hours, all night. Every reason to go. But I see you. 
despite the pain, despite the exhaustion, you get off the floor, you stand in front of the mirror, and with lips that can barely make it over the waves, you promise yourself, not today. Not today, I'll make it another day for her, for him, for them, and I see you. I've never seen you more strong than in that moment. I'm with you in the water. And if you find yourself in the deep and think you are lost to all the world, I hope you see heaven open. And I hope you hear my voice saying, I see you. I see you, B-Town. I see you, son. I see you, daughter. I'm so proud of you. You're my beloved. And I'd go anywhere to be where you are. I'm with you in the water. That night, he broke something. He knew all of us would be broken on some level, and he, he broke bread as a symbol, as a reminder. He beyond knows our pain, every person in this room. And we shine the brightest as a church when we understand sometimes it's our brokenness, guys, and our hurt. It's what's going to bring healing to the world. So let's eat and remember that he was broken for us. Better than, and if anybody was better than death, if anyone was was better than deserving to be crucified, beat, crushed, it's Jesus. He said, if this is what it takes, if it takes every ounce of my blood, not not to reveal again, guys. This isn't about to reveal how horrible you are. I'm saying this is how far I'll go let you know I want to be with you and if I'm in you we're going to put this into us if I'm in you how far would you go for those that are hurting too to be with them I want us all to be together at the table I spilled it all to be with you let's go out and do the same and spill that all over the world it's such a beautiful symbol of what he wants for us to be with people he's forgiven us something a place with him his power, his spirit. And he sees us all trying in those sufferings. And let's remember through his power, it's not on ours, right? Through his power, what he's done. We have the forgiveness of sins for yours, for mine, for the many. So let's drink and remember. Neil's going to play this song. I'm just going to pray real quick. This song is one of those, like, I told my wife when I die, I just, if there's any ceremony, you can just play this for five hours over and over. <laughs> just do it. Y'all heard me say it. Or don't. Just put me in a BFI bin and send me off. I don't care. I'm good. But guys, everything changes. How did Jesus do it? How did he do it? Because there was something inside of him over and over. No matter what I see, no matter what they say, I'm his boy. He loves me. He's proud of me. I'm his boy. He loves me. He's proud of me. And that makes no sense for me, and I'm sure for many of you. But I promise you, if you can tune into that voice in your life, That's why I love this passage. I feel like everything Jesus did, he came from a place like my dad loves me and he's proud of me. And that's what God wants us to leave here today, knowing that's what he wants us to know. I love you. And when you're with and you suffer, and you're doing it for me. I'm so proud of you. He loves us, guys. So Father, we're gonna just take a minute and let this wash over us. Let your love wash over us, Jesus. 
thank you for loving us. Thank you for going all the way. Father, thank you for loving us. Spirit, thank you for resting on us. Thank you for giving us a power we could never do. I pray in your name right now that there's people that thought I, I, I couldn't, I can't, and right now they know I can because you did. You did, and you're in me. We want to be a people marked by your compassion, Jesus. And that starts with knowing you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.